Good Wednesday, First Presbyterian Church family and friends. This is Pastor Matt, and it's time for us to come together yet again for our midweek virtual Bible study. I do want to remind you uh, that we have started back our midweek prayer meeting, and so we are going to meet tonight in the Fellowship Hall at 6.30 p.m. Uh, to sing, to hear God's Word, to pray together, uh, to even lift up our specific needs and requests to the Father, uh, knowing that He bends an ear to listen to the prayers of His children. And so please come for this corporate time of prayer. Uh, we hope to see you there, and we hope that you would feel comfortable in coming. Please do know that all the sanitation uh, requirements have been followed in the Fellowship Hall, just like they have been in the sanctuary the past few weeks. And and the, and the Fellowship Hall is properly social distanced as well. And so uh, there are sections of four chairs for each family that will attend. And so we hope that you will uh, see this as an opportunity to come back together, uh, to spend time with one another, to sing praises to our God, and to pray. Uh, and so we hope to see you soon. But nonetheless, we are here this afternoon to look at Micah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. 1 through 8. Now, admittedly, there is a section of text, verses 9 through 16, that we won't handle in this chapter as as the Lord proclaims judgment against Israel. But really what we are seeing here is a court case of sorts uh, where the Lord drags Israel into the courtroom. And he begins to tell them all the marvelous things that he has done for them. And then he confronts them with the fact that they have not lived for his glory out of gospel thankfulness of what he has done. And so before we even jump into uh, these first eight verses, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it is perfect and that it is good for us to come to listen to you speak. And so, Father, we pray that you would speak loudly, that you would send more of your spirit to give us those ears to hear so that we may hear you speak, and that the spirit would take these words and it would apply them to our hearts so that we may uh, go forth and live out of gospel thankfulness, live to the glory and honor of thy name. We pray this in your son's name, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's read our text. Hear what the Lord says. Arise and plead your case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. Hear you mountains, the indictment of the Lord and you enduring foundations of the earth for the Lord has an indictment against his people, and he will contend with Israel. O oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I wearied you? Answer me. For I brought you up out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O oh, my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him. And what happened to Shittim, to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord? With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with the calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with the thousands of rams, with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In 1962, everybody was uh, enamored with the intense and dramatic court scene of the latest movie, To Kill a Mockingbird. Of course, that movie was produced out of a love for the novel that Harper Lee had wrote just two years prior. But there it was in the, in the thick of this movie, really in the apex of this plot, that there is a, a robust court scene that takes place. In fact, if you are familiar with the novel, and I hope that you are, it's a fantastic book, uh, you know that there's about five chapters in this written book containing this court scene, and, and it really is the, the primary focus of the movie itself. But, but it was a court scene that gripped the reader, 
that captivated the watching audience. And what was so important and dramatic about it is that it was not just Tom Robinson uh, standing and answering for his supposed crimes. See, what had happened, even while the trial had targeted Tom Robinson, what we found is it was the town of Maycomb that was indeed on trial. And we probably know the story. I hope I'm not giving away any spoilers here. But, but even as Atticus lost the court case, we saw a city. We saw a city and her sins being revealed. We saw a city who was guilty of prejudice and hatred. And not only were they guilty in it, they loved their sins. And in a real way, what we see here in our text is Israel being put on trial just like the town of Maacham was. Just like the just like the city and her sins were revealed through the court case, what we see here is the sins of Israel being revealed and the punishment being proclaimed by the Lord himself. Now, one of the things that we have to remember here, and we can't get into all the, all the nuances of the whole minor prophet Micah, but we have to remember that each time that we have a proclamation of judgment, there is an invitation for grace and repentance. And so this is all throughout, the, all throughout the words of the prophet Micah. But here it is that, that the proclamation has already been made. Trouble is coming because of your sins. The Lord is going to carry out his judgment because of your sins. They're in the midst of strife, Israel is. They're in the midst of a coming doom. They're in the midst of what is called so often in the prophets, the day of the Lord. Now, when we talk about the day of the Lord, we have to understand that it carries a, a positive connotation for the people of God because the day of the Lord is the day that we see God. And the day that we see God, we will be made like him, holy and blameless, just as he is, and he will usher us into the heavens with our glorified bodies. But the day of the Lord is a day of fear and reckoning for his enemies, for those who transgress against him, for those who don't trust in him for their salvation, for those who are not repentant of their sins. The day of the Lord is, is something that should cause them to tremble because it is on that day that they meet their judgment and eternal torment and hell. Well, here the Old Testament gives us gives us glimpses, illustrations of that judgment and also that grace and restoration. And it happens right here for the people of God. There is a coming judgment because of your sins. You will face the judgment of God because you have transgressed against him, but understand people that this will only be for a season. Your destruction, your judgment, your exile will only be for a season. For the Lord reigns. All of this is in Micah. The Lord reigns and he will deliver and Christ will reign forever and ever. And so all in the middle of this, Micah begins to speak on behalf of the Lord to talk about a gospel thankfulness, a way to live your life that, that shows that you are not only changed by the gospel, but thankful for the work of the gospel, even in your own life. And so I want you to see really two things. I want you to see the righteous acts of the Lord first. And, and in a chunk, it's there in verses 1 through 5. But look back at verses 1 through 2 with me very quickly. Hear what the Lord says. So here it is that Micah is speaking on behalf of the Lord. Micah is is speaking to the people. Remember all the way back in Micah 1 and 2, we remember that, that he's standing in the city square and he's wailing and he's lamenting uh, and he's calling the nation to repentance. Well, here he is calling the nation to repentance again. And he says, hear what the Lord says. Well, hear what Yahweh says. Notice there it is the, the covenant name of the Lord. This is Yahweh. 
hear what Yahweh says. And notice who he calls in this court case as his first witness. It, it's the mountains. See, what Mike is doing here is that uh, he's the prosecutor of sorts for the, for the nation of Israel. And the first place or the first witness he calls is the mountains and the hills. And why would he call the mountains and the hills? Is this uh, some sort of figure of speech? Well, sort of, but it makes sense to us. Because here it is that the mountains are the witnesses because they have endured through the years and they have seen the sins of the people of Israel. And he says, so mountains, hills, foundations of the earth tell us what has gone on in the nation of Israel for you have seen it and you have heard it all. You know, this, this kind of figure of speech, so to speak, shouldn't um, shouldn't bother us too much because we say things like, wow, if, if these walls could just talk. We say things like that all the time. And, and why do we say things like that? Well, because we want to hear the stories that they have to tell. I remember, uh, and I think I've told you this story before, but I remember when Beth and I and some family members went to Boston and we walked the Freedom Trail. And we rode, you know, we rode through the city. Uh, we walked the trail. We went into all of these, these churches and historical markers. And you could just hear people over and over and over again. Uh, they, they just kept saying, wow, if these walls could talk. Think about the history that they could tell us. Think about how they could, how they could tell us about Paul Revere writing that infamous night, telling us that the that the British were coming. Think about the churches in Salem that could that could tell us all about the the you know the the Salem witch trials. Tell us, you know, imagine what these walls could tell us about George Washington sitting in these pews and and we say things like that. And and that's exactly what's happening here in verses one and two. The prosecutor, Micah, is calling these these mountains and these hills and the foundations of the earth to, to be a witness against the people of Israel for their sins. But you notice, don't you, there when you jump into verses 3 through 5, the speaker changes. In verses 1 through 2, it's Micah. And then verses 3 through 5, it's the Lord now speaking to his people. Micah is clearly not speaking. This is the Lord speaking to the people of Israel. Oh, my people. Oh, my people. Now, there's some gospel language there because even in the midst of coming judgment, even in the midst of God calling out their sins, he still calls them his people. I want you to notice that. But, no, but notice also what he asks. How have I wearied you? How have I wearied you? Now, this is um, kind of this idea of being worn out or exhausted. So the, so the Lord wants to know how he has worn his people out, how he has been such a pain to deal with, how he has been so boring and mundane in his care for them. And to prove that he has been exactly the opposite, he begins to review the grace and redemption of, that he has provided for them so that they may remember the righteous acts that he has accomplished for them. Notice how he begins to talk. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt. It's right there in verse 4. And I redeemed you from the house of slavery. And I, uh, even further, I gave you good leaders. I gave you Moses and Aaron and Miriam. Uh, remember all of these kings that I defeated for you so that you may have this land of promise. Notice all of these things, and I'm reminding you of these things so that you may remember the righteous acts of the Lord. All of these saving acts that I've done on your behalf, I want you to recall all of them because what I'm asking you to do is, is nothing compared to the marvelous things that that I have done for you. I have asked you to live in a certain way, and it should not be that 
It should not be that burdensome because I have delivered you time and time and time again. And in the way he calls them my people in verse 3, it is given us the reminder that, that not only has he delivered us in the past, but that he will also deliver us in the future. And you know, that pushes us to think, I believe, about what the Lord has done for us. It, it begins to make us realize that, that the Lord has done really even these exact things for us. That he has delivered us out of bondage. That he has delivered us from oppressing kings. That he has given us a land of inheritance that he is preparing for us even now. He has done great things. And in his greatness, he asks us, out of a gospel gratitude to live a life that enjoys him and glorifies him from now and for and to forever. With all of these powerful acts of uh, vindication and grace, the question before us is the same question that was before the Israelites as God spoke to them. How do you respond to the things that I have done for you? That really pushes us to the second thing I want us to see. Because here in verses 6 through 8, it tells us what does the Lord require from us. If you look down at verse 8, we'll go back to uh, verses 6 and 7. But if you go down to verse 8, I'm going to change our color here a bit. But it says, He has told you, O man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? You notice what he's doing there in verses 6 and 7 compared to verse 8, I hope. He, he's, he's given us a little bit of not that, but this. And actually, he's, he's taking away the guesswork from us as well. You notice there's some options here in verses 6 through 7. And, and it's almost, uh, it almost seems like it's being some sort of uh, a guesswork to, to, you know, what am I going to do to please the Lord? And, and, then, and then he says, I have told you. Notice again, it's, it's Micah speaking on behalf of the Lord. But he says, the Lord has told you, O oh man, what is good and what he requires of you in this life as Christians. The Lord has told us what he wants. He has told us how he desires for us to live. And it's simply a, a faithful life that is gracious and good, just as the Lord has been gracious and good to us. Now, if we could spend time in this, this entire book of the Bible, we uh, would be able to draw out how Micah's audience, the, the nation of Israel, Israel had forcibly taken other people's lands and possessions. They have treated one another as less than human. They have selfishly cheated others so that they may have financial gain. They've had unjust relationships, and it's, and it's exactly the opposite of what Micah is, is, is really proclaiming the correct response to the Lord is. And so he, he tells us, the Lord has told you how to live, and, it, and in fact, you've lived the exact opposite of the way the Lord has told you to do it. We actually see that uh, if we spent time here in verses 9 and 10, and 11 and, and 12, uh, you, you'll see almost this, uh, this, this negative side of verse 8. Because what does the Lord say for us to do? To do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. That's the end of verse 8. Well, verses 9 through 12 are the exact opposite of those things. And, and, and what the Lord is saying is, you've done the exact opposite of what I wanted you to do. So the mountains are going to tell me about it. The foundations of the, of the earth are going to witness against you because you have not walked with me. You have not loved kindness. You have not done justice. And so we, we, we have to understand here that the, that the Lord is, is calling us to live a certain way out of gospel gratitude for what he has done. 
he, he's telling us that this is not some way to, to earn our salvation, nor is this some program for a works-based salvation to, to earn anything. No, this is just a pattern of gospel living. We walk with our God. We reaffirm that this life is, is an ongoing communion and fellowship with, with Him. And you think, well, Matt, why, would you, why should we do this? Why should we do justice? Why should we love kindness? Why should we walk humbly with our God? Well, believer, it's because the Lord has done so much for you. That's, that's the whole tie-in from our first point to our second point. And as New Testament believers, we know all the more of what God has done. For we have Christ. We have Christ who lived and died for us. We have Christ who has taken away our guilt and our shame. We have Christ who defeated the grave. We have Christ who gives us life eternal. We have Christ that intercedes at the right hand of the Father. We have Christ who is waiting to come back for us and he longs to be with us in heaven. We have Christ who keeps us secure in the hands of the Father. We have Christ who will who will give us our home everlasting. We have Christ who will restore our bodies and glorify them. We have Christ. Something the Old Testament believers didn't have, but we do as New Testament Christians and and so all the more should we be should we be yearning to live in gospel gratitude because what is our response to what Christ has done is to do justice is to love kindness is to walk humbly with our God to do justice to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God do you notice a little trend there that our world is is really full of the opposite things and so what the Lord is calling us to do is revolutionary then a world full of injustices we should do justice in a world full of hatred we should love kindness and in a world that tells us to walk our own way we should walk humbly with God Really, that's a summary of the Old Testament where we have law after law after law to tell us how to do these things. Well, how do we know how to do these things? We look to Christ. We look to Christ. We don't look to the Old Testament law for that's been fulfilled in him. We look to Christ. And so do you want to know how to do justice? Look to Jesus. If you want to know how to love kindness, look to Jesus. Do you want to know how to walk in the will of the Father? Look to Jesus. For he teaches us how to love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And he tells us how to love our neighbor. And so we, so, so may we strive to live lives more like Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Hope to see you soon.